This is CBC Here and Now. Fire and water. City says hydrant pressure wouldn't have made any difference fighting this blaze. Joe Smythe used appropriate force in the shooting death of Don Dunphy, so says the inquiry report. The Muskrat Falls cost overrun report. Did former Nalcor boss Ed Martin see it? The Premier says yes. Well, hope you soaked up the sun today because parts of the island are about to get satched. Your weather details coming up. Well, late this afternoon, fire, homes leveled, questions linger. That's our top story tonight as the fallout continues from a dramatic residential fire in St. John's on Monday. Terry Roberts has been covering that story today, and he joins us live now from the scene with more. Terry. Well, yes, Jeremy, it's been a, a very difficult 24 hours for the people here on Froud Avenue. Fire leveled these two buildings behind me. Eight housing units destroyed. 20 people who lived in them lost everything. And of course, 35 units in all housing units affected by this disaster last evening. Fire broke out just before 6 o'clock on Monday. The buildings constructed in the 1950s quickly up in flames, forcing families into the street. Firefighters were quick to the scene, but they faced an unexpected challenge, limited water supply. And this is an old part of, part of town. Uh, we've got a 12-inch main that runs down through the main uh, Black Marsh Road area, but they cut into 8-inch mains running into here, so the infrastructure uh, gives us limited water supply. The old line runs in a loop and pressure quickly dropped as hoses were hooked to hydrants. A water truck on the scene was quickly sucked dry. By this morning, residents were asking questions about the level of fire protection. The firemen had nothing to work with last night. Their Did supply you... of water, when they came first, when they unhooked the hose, the water that came out wouldn't put out a cinder fire. And you, you saw their frustration? I saw, yeah, I could see. At one point last night, we counted 11 firemen stood up in frustration. No water. The water coming was inadequate to fight that blaze. And only the wind died down, all this block would have went. This afternoon, city leaders tried to answer those questions. With a fire of that magnitude, you have to take into account that it takes a very unusual amount of water and truck power to put that kind of a fire down. But if you had more modern infrastructure in the ground last night, could you have uh, you know, mitigated some of the damage? I can't enter into a hypothetical firefighting situation here right now. That's not something I'm prepared to do. It's 2017 and the city of St. John's, uh, there are questions today about uh, infrastructure in the ground to be able to fight a serious fire. What, how, what do you make of that? Well, all I can say is that there was an underwrite, um, a review done by Fire Underwriting Services which indicated that St. John's Regional Fire Department was only one of three firefighting services in Canada that had top ratings in both commercial and residential fire protection. And a big part of that rating came from the water delivery system. Now the city has plans to install thousands of meters of new water lines over the next two years. But it doesn't appear that Froud Avenue is at the top of that priority list. Now just look around. This is not a rich neighborhood. Mostly homes, social housing units owned by Newfoundland and Labrador Housing. Now that's prompted some people in this area to ask, is that why the ground infrastructure right here has not been upgraded? Now I asked Councillor Danny Breen that very question today and he said, absolutely not. Now, the question is, what happened? What caused this fire last night? Well, the RNC are still investigating and say they'll have an answer soon. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Terry Roberts in St. John's. Now, Terry mentioned the amount of water pressure available at the fire site. In about 15 minutes, a member of the Froud Avenue Community Center, who was on site last night, talks about what she saw. The provincial government has released Justice Leo Barry's report from the inquiry into the police shooting death of Don Dunphy. The 58-year-old Mitchellsbrook man was fatally shot by Constable Joe Smythe on April 5, 2015. This winter, Justice Barry heard from more than 50 witnesses. And our... Uh our here and now's <laughs> Mark Quinn is joining us in the studio. He's been following this inquiry, haven't you, Mark, right from the beginning? Absolutely. And you were at the release of the report today. 
That's right, Debbie. Commissioner Leo Barry's report largely vindicates Smythe's actions. Barry says Smythe should have visited, visited Dumphy in 2015. He also says Dumphy's tweets weren't threatening, but they did merit follow-up by the police. Now, Barry also concluded that Smythe used appropriate force in self-defense when he shot Dumphy, but he did criticize some of Smythe's actions. Also, Smythe also made certain errors of judgment in the course of the investigation. Uh, he had communicated uh, uh, inappropriately with uh, certain media uh, individuals. He, he consulted with a colleague uh, in preparing uh, his notes for his first uh, RCMP interview. Uh, so there were matters such as that uh, for which he could be criticized, but in fairness to him, on the other side, uh, he gave his testimony uh, very spontaneously. Now, Barry was critical of the RCMP's investigation of the shooting. He found the RCMP's decision not to charge Smythe was correct. But Barry listed what he called defects in the RCMP's investigation of the shooting. Although he ultimately agreed with the RCMP's conclusions, he said the force was too quick to accept Smythe's versions of events. There may have been some evidence missed by, for example, uh, the fact that there was a less than robust uh, investigation uh, at the time by, it was my belief anyhow, by the RCMP. Uh, they uh, could have uh, pushed more strongly at the beginning to test uh, Constable Smythe's testimony. But ultimately, uh, I'm satisfied uh, that any of the deficiencies in their approach uh, did not make their decision wrong. Now, the more than 500-page report will likely be difficult for Dumphy's daughter, Megan, to read. Barry discounted what she suggested may have happened. He found there was no evidence that Dumphy raised a stick, not a gun. For his part, Minister, uh, Justice Minister Andrew Parsons believes the almost $3 million report will help restore public trust in the police force in this province. He said he will have more to say about Barry's finding when the Justice Department uh, has more time to review those findings. Debbie? Thanks very much. That's our Mark Quinn reporting for us live this evening. Changing mental health and addictions care in this province is an urgent issue, says the Premier. And this morning, the government released its plan to make major changes over the next five years. All 54 recommendations from the All-Party Committee on Mental Health will be acted upon. Key points include replacing the Waterford Hospital with a new, smaller facility, bringing more services and more beds to regions across the province, taking inmate care out of the hands of the Department of Justice and placing it under the Department of Health, establishing a new mobile crisis intervention team with a plain close police officer and mental health worker in an unmarked car. It is a comprehensive plan and one that's been a long time coming for many people. Here now is Megan McCabe reports. Mike has been in the criminal justice and mental health care systems for years. Diagnosed with PTSD and bipolar disorder, he's medicated, but it hasn't kept him out of jail, last leaving a halfway house back in September. That's a good idea, but I've been on the waiting list for over six months and I just got out of the penitentiary and they had my referral from psychiatrists, everything and all stuff about that when I came back here that I need to be put on the mental like for mental health and all that stuff and everything I'm still waiting. Inside the gathering place this morning Health Minister John Hagee says the government wants everyone waiting for mental health services to get them. The new plan is based on the stepped care approach because most people don't need severe interventions. Stepped care starts with things like AA meetings, self-help websites and goes all the way up to long-term hospitalization. The value of such an approach is it actually matches uh, individuals' needs to the level of care that they need to access. It increases access to services by matching these people to appropriate levels of care. Haggy says the government is committed to making these changes for everyone in the province, particularly those beyond the overpass. Today, it sounds like uh, St. John's is not going to be the center of mental health for the province, which is... I think the biggest breath of fresh air I've heard in a long time. People need to be able to stay in their own regions, if not their own communities. As for replacing this Victorian institution with a new, smaller facility in St. John's, there's no word yet on when exactly that'll happen or how long people like Mike will be waiting. Megan McCabe, CBC News, St. John's. To the cost overruns at Muskrat Falls now, and a question some people are asking tonight. 
When Ed Martin was the head of Nalcor, did he see the 2013 Muskrat Falls report warning of ballooning costs and delays? Well, today the premier says he was told Martin was there when SNC Lavalin, when the SNC Lavalin report was discussed. But that's not what the former head of Nalcor says happened. In a statement, Martin said, I did not receive this report in 2013. It is an internal SNC Lavalin document that was neither presented nor sent to me at Nalcor. Martin says he did know of the risks and made a plan, but the current premier is questioning that. And at that point, he could have stopped the project of these massive cost overruns. Today, he felt he addressed the risk. But with almost $4 billion over the original price tag, I would question, I would question his statement and ask the people of this province if they agree. In about 15 minutes, the former head of Nalcor, Ed Martin, will join us live to address the latest concerns raised about the Muskrat Falls development. The company at the center of last week's deadly tower crash released a statement today. Forbes brothers say progress is being made in the investigation that killed two men on June 19th. One of the preliminary findings, the crew working on the tower at the time of the accident was an experienced one. Forbes also said there's no date for a full return to work on the transmission line. As we've told you, tonight the province's justice minister has released the report into the fatal shooting of Don Dumphy. It has concluded that the police officer involved used appropriate force. More on that in about three minutes. Get ready, country music fans. Blake Shelton has his sights set on central Newfoundland. This summer will have the details later.
Welcome back, everyone. And Carolyn has a dandy picture to show yes. all of you. <laughs> well, yesterday we were showing the kids at the splash pad cooling down, so I just <laughs> wanted to show this picture. This is Charlie in Bowering Park. Chilling. Yes, <laughs> chilling in the park. So I just thought that was a sweet, sweet picture. Thank you very much to Christine Hamlin for uh, posting that on Ryan's Facebook page. So let's see what is on the way in terms of the weather. In Lab City tonight, yes, there is a risk of frost. So I just wanted to make sure you knew that in case you had any frost sensitive plants, you might want to bring them in just in case. We have some heavy rain coming tomorrow for the Buren Peninsula in particular, as well as parts of the east. So I'll get to that in a moment. And I may be getting ahead of myself, but I just wanted to throw this in that so far things are looking not so nice for Memorial Day slash Canada Day this Saturday for the East in particular. So we'll get to that a little bit later in the long range. But uh, yeah, so far not so great, but things can change. I'm optimistic. So tonight we do have that risk of frost in Lab City and some showers coming through. Not, not a whole lot of shower action happening there, but you could see some showers mostly cloudy over the island tonight. Not a whole lot happening. Lows between 8 and 11 degrees and uh, lows in Lab Labrador looking at about five degrees along the coast and 10 in Happy Valley Goose Bay with a risk of showers there. So tomorrow we have this system that is moving in. So that is going to hit the island at about noon time. And it's mostly going to affect the central northeast coast, the east. Corner Brook may escape some of it uh, tomorrow, but uh, yes, we do have some heavy, heavy showers coming for the Buren. Now we're going to start the day 7 a.m., 14 degrees in St. John's, overcast skies. But then around noontime, those heavy rains are going to move in about 15 to 25 millimeters during the daytime. And the rain should continue into the evening about 5 millimeters overnight. So so it's also going to cool down in the night, 13 degrees uh, at about 7 o'clock tomorrow night. So this is how things are looking. Cool in Fairyland tomorrow, 12 degrees as the high with showers there. Marystown, Buren Peninsula, you're going to get the most showers it looks like right now. Uh, 25 to 40 millimeters during the day. Not quite enough for a rainfall warning, but uh, still a significant amount of rain. So you can see the rain as well in central parts of the island. 20 degrees, so it'll be rainy, but at least it will be warm. Uh, still that rain along the, the south coast there, cooler in Port of Basque, 12 degrees. Now, it, Corner Brook is just kind of on the tail of this system. So right now it's calling for cloudy skies and 20 degrees. So hopefully you'll be able to uh, dodge that system. Looking quite nice up in the Straits. 20 degrees in St. Anthony, 22 in Mary's Harbor. It'll be a bit cloudy during the day, but at least it is warm. And there are also some showers coming for parts of Labrador. Labrador City, 19 degrees with a chance of showers as well in Churchill Falls and along the coast. But a nice uh, sunny day coming for Nain and 11 degrees as the high. So as I mentioned, Canada Day so far is not looking great for the east, for the island and for Labrador. Things are shaping up quite nicely, but uh, we'll get to that a little bit later in the long range. Debbie. Thanks very much, Carolyn. The more than 500 pages of the Barry report on the Don Dunphy inquiry are now available for people to read. Earlier today, inquiry commissioner Leo Barry and Justice Minister Andrew Parsons took reporters' questions on the report. Here's more of what Barry had to say about his findings. Uh, it's not easy to give uh, simplistic answers. There are no simplistic answers, so You'll see uh, I made certain key recommendations, uh, which I believe uh, would go a long way to avoiding this happening in the future. Uh, one has to do with uh, better training, more modern training uh, for uh, police officers in the, uh, in the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary. And in fact, any police officers who work in the province should be trained in the, in the modern approach uh, where the emphasis is on uh, de-escalation or defusing of a situation rather than resorting to force. Force uh, is not uh, an option that's accepted. It happens only uh, when, when all else fails. And uh, uh, we wanted to make sure in this inquiry that we put our foot on, uh, sorry, put our finger on the things that could be done uh, to improve the ability of police officers uh, to de-escalate uh, rather than having to resort to force, particularly lethal force. 
the title of the report is, is Promoting Public Trust, Police Investigating Police-Involved Shootings. So my emphasis has been on uh, ensuring that an investigation uh, in future, when it's carried out, uh, is uh, uh, carried out in a fashion that uh, the public has uh, confidence with. And uh, I think uh, that seeing the, the depth of which we went in, in uh, exploring the issues, uh, I, I believe the, the public uh, uh, will have confidence that the results are as set out here. Uh, there may have been some evidence missed by, for example, uh, the fact that there was a less than robust uh, investigation uh, at the time, by, it was my belief anyhow, by the RCMP. Uh, they uh, could have uh, pushed more strongly at the beginning to test uh, Constable Smythe's testimony, but ultimately uh, I'm satisfied uh, that any of the deficiencies in their approach uh, did not make their decision wrong. They, they reached the, the correct decision that there were no charges to be laid uh, in, in the matter. We return now to last evening's devastating fire in St. John's. Eight homes on Froud Avenue were destroyed, leaving 13 families homeless. Firefighters arrived shortly after 6 p.m. In addition to fighting the flames, they were challenged by what seemed to be a lack of water pressure in nearby fire hydrants. Here now is Terry Roberts spoke with a local resident about her concerns. Well, there's a big concern, right? that the city or someone is going to have to answer, right? Because we have people here from infancy to seniors in their 90s. We have people with mobility issues, and we have people on oxygen, and we have babies. And to have 144 units here and not able to safely, safely supply water is a major concern for us as tenants. And what, 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 what has this done to the lives of people here? Well, it's devastating. I mean, I'm here over 20 years, and my neighbours directly across from me, they're all very good people, hard-working people that today are left, as you can see, with the rumble. They're left with nothing, only the shirt on their back. And there's pets displaced, there's pets that ran last night, and, and they can't find them today, right? Um, as lucky, with the grace of God, we're, we're all here today. There's no loss of life, which is good. Um, if the wind was in another direction, the whole block would have went because there was no water. When the firemen showed up first, and God love them, they did what they could, my heart goes out to them, and to Newfoundland Labrador Housing, and to the Women's Centre, and Froud Avenue Community Centre. They did all they could for the tenants, but the, the firemen had nothing to work with last night. Their did supply you? of water, when they came first, when they unhooked the hose, the water that came out wouldn't put out a cinder fire. And you, you saw their frustration? I saw, yeah, I could see. At one point last night, we counted 11 firemen stood up in frustration. No water. The water coming was inadequate to fight that blaze. And only the wind died down, all this block would have went. This afternoon, the city spoke about the water pressure issue. Councillor Danny Breen says there are areas, especially in older parts of the city, where our main infrastructure requires upgrades, and these upgrades are ongoing. But he says this does not compromise the ability of the fire department to respond. Former Nalcor CEO Ed Martin is live in studio. Up next, he'll address some of the latest questions being raised about the controversial and costly Muskrat Falls development.
Welcome back to Here and Now. The Premier unleashed another volley today in the Muskrat Falls War of Words. He says the former CEO of Nalcor knew about a report outlining the risks for cost overruns for Muskrat Falls back in 2013. Ed Martin said in a statement last night he never saw the SNC-Lavalin report. This is the latest development since current CEO Stan Marshall revealed the cost of the project has ballooned by another billion dollars to $12.7 billion, and Ed Martin joins me now. Thank you very much for being here. So who is telling the truth, you or the Premier? Uh, Debbie, all I can do is uh, you know, state uh, you know, the facts as I see them. Uh, the main reason that I've uh, come out to uh, have some words after 14 to 15 months of, uh, of retirement and heading into private life is because the information that has been uh, out there over the past several days is just not correct. Um, I'll just go back over what's happened. Uh, there has been an allegation that an SNC Lavalin internal report, not a Nalcor risk report, but an internal SNC Lavalin report. Uh, was was uh, was received by me. Was given to me. Received by me, and uh, and uh, for whatever reason, willful or, 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 or otherwise, I didn't react and do anything to that report. That's categorically not correct. Today so if I just want, yes. just give me a chance okay. to finish here. Sure. Now. Um, so um, you know, first point is I did not receive the report. Uh, the second point, and probably more importantly, uh, is the fact that in that report, which I did review over the weekend, I had a copy. Uh, there is a list of risks that are in there, and, uh, and I know for certain that each of those risks is actually reflected in the NALCOR risk plan that was uh, formed uh, early in the project and maintained throughout the project, and each of those risks had a mitigation plan against them, and the project team was diligent to the extent possible in mitigating those risks. And to me, that's the most important part, the, the idea that the project team and myself were not constantly and diligently driving the risk register, the risk mitigation of the project, and, uh, and following up on every item constantly, that's just a, an allegation that cannot be left to well, say. What do you think is at play here? Because today the Premier came out uh, after Friday bringing the subject up and then today said that you were in uh, the room when this report and uh, suggestions of risks were raised by SNC Lavalin. Uh, and you are saying that you categori categorically were not there? Maybe I'm not going to get into, uh, you know, a war of words with the Premier of the province. That, that's not the point. And, um, you know, I'm here because I want to make sure that people understand just what I explained mm -hmm. a minute ago. Okay. There's really not much more for me to say about it than that. It's just something that I cannot let stand, the fact that a project team which has been so diligent and so professional uh, you know, in, in, in following up, identifying risk, following up, mitigating them. Some very successful, and yes, some not as successful. Uh, we know that. But I'm saying uh, there's no way that I can stand by and suggest that we were not, uh, you know, managing and identifying risks uh, throughout the project. And the risks that were actually in that internal SNC Lavalin report were definitely in the Nalcor register. And actually, SNC Lavalin personnel form a significant part of the team at Nalcor, within Nalcor, that contribute to the internal risk. Uh, risk report. So that information was clearly there and we were clearly dealing with it as we went forward. I just, uh, there are so many issues to talk about, uh, about Muskrat Falls, so I want to get through a few of them uh, since last Friday's announcement of the uh, cost uh, escalation again. And the, the cost is billions more than your last cost estimate when you were still CEO. So if you're not accountable for these increased costs, who is? Um, let's, let, you know, let's break this into time frames. Um, April 2016 is when I left Nalcor. Um, anything before that particular time, um, you know, from a Muskrat Falls perspective, and I'll talk about a couple of other things in a moment, but things that happened up until that point, uh, you know, I've been clear. I've been very available to the public. I've been, uh, for each of the cost increases, any issues that happened on the project, I explained them. I went through them in detail and made myself totally transparent and public with respect to that. And uh, obviously, from that perspective, uh, you know, uh, I have responsibility up until April of 2016. Um, anything past April of 2016, there's a split there. I have no more dealings with the company. Um, you know, I have not been in touch uh, with the senior management of the company. 
I have not been engaged in any decision making, obviously. So, so has from the there four on, billion. So, so from there on in, I can't take account. So of is the that. four billion extra that we've seen since you left? Is that all the responsibility of the current leadership? So let's uh, once again. There's so many numbers being thrown. Yeah, I know, around. and it's difficult. It's for difficult, us to uh, talk you know. About and and when, when you say that number, I mean, you know, it's not making sense uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, and you have to have an apples to apples comparison. Uh, the way the costs are managed, when we started this project, it was sanctioned at $6.2 billion, not including interest. So take the interest out of the equation, because these are the facility costs that we are controlling. When I left in April 2016, uh, uh, from my perspective, the costs were stabilized at $8.8 .8 billion, not including interest. In, that, uh, in, in between those uh, two, two numbers, um, I had been very clear uh, throughout what was driving those increases. It went into three categories. One category was, uh, um, was the scope changes that we made with, in all good conscience to improve the actual uh, facility for the future. Uh, second category was there, a, there was a hot contractor market at the time. And the third uh, category was there was issues with some contractors, particularly in startup and execution, Staldi being one of them. I explained that all the way through. I've been very transparent on it. And up to that point, uh, to the 8.8 .8 million 8.8 .8 billion, excluding interest. That's where I say I'm accountable. The current anything past that? Um, no, I can't say I'm accountable for because I don't know what has happened Stan, since then. Stan Marshall said on Friday that uh, initial costs were extremely underestimated. Anyone with the knowledge of the business uh, would have known they were low. How do you respond to that? And were there's another question keeps coming up. Were those initial costs lowball to get project sanction. So let's look at the, quickly at the process and, 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 and what's being suggested here. Uh, internal and Alcor uh, experts, engineers, uh, you know, uh, account, professional accountants, uh, cost engineers, supplemented by SNC Laverman uh, professionals prepared the, prepared the estimate. In addition to that, they brought in external experts for various pieces of it, for specialized engineering and specialized design and to, and to formulate the estimate. That estimate was um, checked in depth by both Manitoba Hydro, which published a report, which can be found on the website. Navigant also did a review of that uh, cost estimate and, uh, and rated it uh, as an excellent cost estimate. And you can see that posted on the website. In addition to that, uh, with respect to the federal loan guarantee, the federal government came in with an independent engineer who went through uh, that information. The, uh, the federal government uh, and, and obviously the bankers that they're working with are familiar with the cost basis, as is the province. So I just want to ask this question. Uh, you know, if you're talking about lowballing an estimate or suggesting that something improper was done, well, just think of the scenario where you would have to bring in all of those groups that I just mentioned, plus all of the NALCOR professional engineers, uh, professional accountants, and all the people all the way up through the organization that have to sign off an estimate before I do. All those people would have to be gathered in a room, and for somehow everyone would have to agree we're going to lowball this estimate. Now, that, that just does not hold water. There's a call, we're just about out of time, Mr. Martin, but there is a call for uh, an inquiry into this, a forensic audit. Would you welcome that? Um, I will fully support and cooperate. Um, I'm not advocating for it, but I'm, I'm so confident in the work that has been done, I say to myself, this, would, could, could, this could probably be a very, very good idea because it would give everyone a chance, particularly uh, the people who are newer to the project and maybe haven't followed it as closely, particularly the young people in the future, to walk through the rationale for the project, walk through the cost estimates, walk through all the processes that were followed and see the robustness of what is in behind that. The only thing I would suggest, though, is that, uh, and, and I would fully support it in this case, it would have to be, to my mind, uh, a purely independent review and uh, neither a positive or negative outlook going into it and basically trying to come out with, uh, uh, with a list of things that went well, some things that could be improved and use that to improve the future for the province. And for a last comment, would you welcome it now or when the project is over, which the Premier is saying? I'm not in the chair anymore. I'm, 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 I'm a private citizen. I'm out of the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm retired. That is a decision for the current uh, administration and, and uh, NALCOR leadership. Ed Martin, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much. Coming up next, more on the community effort to help those affected by last night's massive fire in St. John's.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Yesterday's fire on Froud Avenue in St. John's destroyed the homes of 20 people. Eight units belonging to Newfoundland and Labrador Housing were completely destroyed. Today, the search for new homes got underway. Here and Now's Avneet Dillon has more. People who can least afford to lose anything lost everything. Donations are pouring in from all over the city here at Froud Avenue Community Center. But last evening, it was local people who banded together to help those directly affected. Just down the street from Freud Community Center is this women's center that took in countless displaced families last night and this morning. Many of the families that came here were families that had no friends or family members who they can stay with. Many of the folks that were here had mobility needs and they had animals with them and children, so they were difficult to house. The minister responsible says everyone received temporary accommodation after last night's fire. Uh, the Newfoundland Labrador Housing Corporation staff were on the scene last night and stayed here to the last person had accommodations. Uh, the status of women, Marguerite's place, were absolutely phenomenal. While some residents were put up at local hotels, that's not a permanent fix. Now others are offering to help. Memorial University has, has stepped up and some people will be moved to MUN in some of the residences for short-term accommodations. As for what happens next, the housing minister says her department is working out how to find new homes for everyone displaced by the fire. We do know that we have a housing shortage here in the city of St. John's, but we do have some emergency placements and uh, we will work to find accommodations for our tenants. Avneet Dillon, CBC News, St. John's. The weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. Well, Carolyn, uh, Canada Today is coming, and mm -hmm. uh, you have a not so hot forecast for well, the. So and it's far. not your fault. It's not your no. fault. You just present the <laughs> and weather. It's just for it's just for the east, and things could change. I was talking to Environment Canada today, and they said that they're going to keep a close eye on it, but it could definitely, definitely change. It's still really early days, but I know people are looking ahead, making so plans. Making yeah. plans. It falls on a Saturday. So it's a holiday on a holiday for a lot of people. It's amazing. <laughs> we'll get to it in just a second, but I wanted to show you this picture. Uh, I had a few people send this particular kind of picture in to me. Uh, three of them, actually. Just a very strange cloud. There was oh. no other cloud in the sky. It looks kind of like smoke billowing Clouds. from something. But out in Springdale, yeah, there was this odd uh, cloud formation. So uh, hmm. that was yesterday evening. So just wanted to show that just, you know, because it's... Because it's cool. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of cool, you know? <laughs> so, uh, quick recap of your forecast for tomorrow. There is rain coming uh, for most of the island. Heaviest on the Buren Peninsula, looking at about 25 to 40 millimeters there. In the east, we're looking at uh, about 15 to 25 during the day. And the showers should continue throughout the evening as well. Not so much uh, heavy rainfall in central, about 2 to 4 uh, during the day. And we're looking at uh, mostly cloudy skies on the west coast in Cornerbrook, 20 degrees as the high there. So chance of showers as well throughout Labrador tomorrow, but fairly warm. We're looking at uh, 19 degrees as the high in Lab City tomorrow and kind of nice over here in the Straits area. Mary's Harbor looking at a 22 degree day tomorrow as the high. So as I mentioned before, this is the system that's kind of coming through on Wednesday and bringing all of those showers and things are going to kind of it's going to kind of linger around for a while on Thursday. You can see all of these uh, showers here and all over the island. So pretty much everyone has a chance of showers coming on Thursday afternoon. So temperatures fairly good on the island here in the east. We're looking at 20 as the high cooler in the west, 15 degrees as the high on Thursday afternoon and showers in eastern Labrador and 12 as the high there. So See how that pans out Thursday evening into Friday. Similar kind of story. It's going to stay fairly warm, but there are all kinds of showers and cloud cover happening. So right now everyone has a chance of showers for Friday afternoon, but things still pretty warm. 22 degrees as the high. We're looking at a 40% chance of showers in the east on Friday and a 19, 18 degrees. So still fairly warm. I'll take that. It's good for the plants. A bit of water and looking up into uh, Labrador, similar story up there, chance of showers and temperatures hovering around 19 degrees. So this is what I was talking about.
about earlier. Right now for St. John's in the eastern part of the province, we're looking at 13 degrees and showers on Canada Day slash Memorial Day. So we'll see how that pans out. Like I said, it's still very, very early days. So I'm optimistic things could change. Uh, looking great in central and in the west, a mix of sun and cloud and temperatures in the 20s. So keep our fingers crossed that uh, things will change. Uh, and in Labrador, Canada today, July 1st, looking quite nice as well. 23 as the high uh, in the eastern part of Labrador and 20 in western Labrador. And then later in the week, some showers moving in, but temperatures staying fairly mild. Our young athlete of the day is nine-year-old Jacob Fifield from Mount Pearl. Jacob has an orange belt in Kimpo at Rock Athletics. At a recent tournament, he received a bronze medal for sparring. Congratulations, Jacob. You are our young athlete of the day. Fire crews in the U.S. Southwest are having big problems with wildfires in three states. We'll have the details in about three minutes. Welcome back to Here and Now. Wildfires are burning across several southwestern states, prompting evacuations and warnings that more people may have to leave their homes on a moment's notice. The CBC's Ken Brunhuber Heimer, sorry, has more from California. No one joins the U.S. Forest Service to cut down trees. But where you see gray branches, they see kindling. It's only the start of the fire season in California, and already it's a bad one. From the air, it looks like a giant burning lash searing the land. Oh my God, look at that. A fire just off a of highway 46 kilometers north of Los Angeles came meters from incinerating a neighborhood, potentially trapping thousands of drivers. It's just one of more than 20 fires burning across seven western states. You might think this winter's record rainfall that officially ended the drought would mitigate the danger this summer, but all that rain is actually the third accelerant. A lot of areas you see are, are wonderfully green right now, which is beautiful. However, those grasses are going to cure out as we continue to move into the summer. 
which is going to result in a condition that is going to be a, a fire danger. We just need to have the right combination of weather conditions. And that combination is here. Now, that's why there have already been so many fires. The solution, according to the U.S. Forest Service, more fires. The state's forestry and fire officials are thinking about expanding their controlled burn program to use up all of that fuel while conditions are still relatively green. By setting many small fires in areas they can manage, they're hoping to avoid the large fires in areas they can't control. Later this week, a little breather. The heat wave, at least, is expected to end. But the millions of dead trees won't disappear, and the grass looks like it's ready to burn. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Sequoia National Park. A new poll suggests the country is all abuzz over what's happening to bees. And as Margot McDermott reports, most Canadians believe that pesticides are to blame for killing off bee populations. The national poll was conducted to get a sense of what Canadians think about bees. The results show they're quite worried. Nine out of ten Canadians blame pesticides for the recent deaths of millions of honeybees. They also think that the loss of habitat, disease and climate change play a role too. The survey of 2,000 people was conducted for the environmental group Friends of the Earth Canada. The head of the group is surprised by the widespread concern about bees in every region of the country. They were consistent across urban and rural. And if anything, maybe a little bit stronger from young people, the millennials, than older people, say 70 plus. So that kind of surprised me. The survey also shows that while most Canadians like bees, they don't know much about them. For example, few people could name one or more types, and very few realize that Canada has 855 species of wild native bees that are far more crucial to pollinating crops than honeybees. A committee of scientists has been trying for six years to get some of those wild bees put on the endangered species list before they disappear altogether. A spokesperson for Environment Canada says they are now actively studying that proposal. But the poll shows the Canadians are split over who's most responsible for protecting bees. 51% think it should be left up to the federal and provincial governments, while nearly a quarter think it's up to the pesticide companies. Margot McDermott, CBC News, Ottawa. The Prime Minister held a Q&A session with reporters in the National Press Theatre today. It's a surefire sign that the summer break has started on the Hill. Reporters quizzed him on a variety of topics, including U.S. President Donald Trump's travel ban. Canadians uh, have been uh, very clear that we see immigration as a net positive, uh, that we know we don't have to compromise security in, in order to build uh, stronger, more resilient communities. And uh, I am going to continue uh, to stand for Canadian values and Canadian uh, success in our immigration system. Justin Trudeau says whether it's on issues like the travel ban or upcoming NAFTA negotiations, Canadians expect him to find a way to work with the U.S. administration. He was also asked about Canadian forces in Iraq after revelations a Canadian sniper fatally shot an ISIS fight fighter from more than three kilometres away. Trudeau insisted troops have an advise and assist mandate and not a combat role. He also said Canadian forces were doing what was expected of them and should be congratulated on their excellence. There are new questions about the police practice of carding. A CBC investigation in Edmonton has found that certain groups are much more likely to be stopped for an ID check. In the black community, people have known that this has been happening and the numbers just prove uh, what we already suspected. The numbers show that last year, Aboriginal women were nearly 10 times as likely to be checked as white people. Blacks were about six times more likely to be stopped. Activists say carding amounts to racial profiling and should be banned. Edmonton police say it's good for intelligence gathering. The European Union has hit Google with a record fine. It's the equivalent of more than 3 billion Canadian dollars. 
The EU says the Internet giant illegally favored another Google product, its own comparison shopping service. And it's alleged Google even gave advantage to its own service when other comparison services offered better deals. The company now has 90 days to stop or it will face more fines. Those will be based on the daily profits of Google's parent company, Alphabet. Her Majesty the Queen is set to get a big raise. The so-called sovereign grant will be roughly 138 million Canadian dollars next year. That's an increase of more than 10 million dollars. It's part of a British government decision to increase her funding to cover expenses for official duties and some home improvements, like the planned 10-year refurbishment of Buckingham Palace. That's incredible, wow. Yeah. In Vancouver, there's a bit of a standoff between Canada Post and a crow. This is Canuck. And his friend, Sean Bergman, the crow is popular in the neighborhood and even has his own Facebook page. <laughs> but the bird was much less friendly to a mail carrier last month. The employee was left bleeding after the bird attacked. Since then, Bergman and his neighbors haven't received any mail at their homes. Canada Post says delivery will resume when it's considered safe. Get ready, Blake Shelton fans. The mass of music stars coming to Newfoundland. Well, the boys around here don't listen to the Beatles run. Old folks sit us through a jukebox needle at the honky tonk where the boots stop all night. <laughs> Shelton is the headliner at a large outdoor festival planned for Grand Falls Windsor this summer. Atlantic Fest 2017 is set for Saturday, August 26th at Centennial Concert Park. Shelton is a five-time CMA Male Vocalist of the Year and, of course, coach on NBC reality show The Voice. More artists are expected to be announced in the coming weeks for the festival. Early bird tickets start at $59.50. How did the turtle cross the road? <laughs> that's the question. Sorry, that's the question in New Brunswick. Motorists there are being asked to watch the roadways for snapping turtles. That's because the province's largest reptiles are laying their eggs on the side of the road. They love the sand the transportation department puts down. 
One well-known turtle, also known as Queen Diana, has been laying her eggs in the same spot in Fredericton every year. But if you happen to see a snapping turtle while driving by, it's best to leave them alone. They can weigh as much as 34 kilograms, not to mention they have a nasty bite. Wow. <laughs> they, I would bite if they were trying to take my young'uns. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I, I'm crazy. not sure if they have, like, you know how we have that moose car crash sign? I wonder <laughs> if they have the turtle crossing sign uh, there in New Brunswick. Wouldn't be a bad idea. Those are big turtles. They are. And I guess they like the water and uh, lots of water uh, coming here tomorrow for uh, the east on the island. Uh, so we're looking at showers and lots of them uh, in St. John's 15 to 25 millimeters tomorrow, 25 to 40 on the Buren Peninsula. So it's going to be a real wet one tomorrow. This is kind of a snapshot of the next two days. So temperatures not too bad on the island tomorrow. We're looking at uh, between 18 and 20 degrees and in Labrador some around 17 to 19 degrees there. So before we leave you, Debbie, this one is for you. Oh, I know I'd this is love to be there. Yes, isn't this nice? It looks like a painting. It does. Yeah, it's really well. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful yep. That is Big Falls. That is on the Humber River, the mm -hmm. magnificent river, and uh, that's north of Deer Lake, about yeah. 40 minutes from Humber Valley. One and of these days I'll get there. That was taken today, so. <sighs> Gorgeous day. Yeah. But sure. tomorrow's a big day. Ryan Snodden makes his return yes, back to here and now. Back. So, we say adios to you too. I'm out. <laughs> See you, everyone. Ryan is back. See you. <laughs> Have a good night. <laughs>